So um, I'm presenting today um, a work uh, I've been done in collaboration with Zhen Cheng Wang and Donald Marol um, on the definition and the computation of entropy in uh, gravity. So I will go through uh, three main points. Uh, in the first one, I will present the problem of defining an entropy um, for uh, space-time regions. Then I will show uh, what are the implications of holography um, in this and the Ryutaka Yanagi formula for computing an entropy. And then I will go through uh, our work and explain how uh, we assign a notion of subsystem to a region of space-time even without uh, holography and by uh, relying on gravitational path integral techniques. Okay, so um, how the path integral is defined. So uh, I start with some space-time boundary uh, and some um, a choice for the metric and the matter fields on it. So a set of boundary conditions. And the path integral uh, gives a finite number which is computed as the integral over all possible configurations that are compatible with these uh, boundary conditions. Um, I will use a very compact notation in which um, the metric and the matter fields are defined, collectively defined by phi and the space-time manifold also includes the choice of metric and matter fields on the boundary. Now, um, we can imagine to um, cut this path integral along uh, um, a surface, a co-dimension one surface, uh, and know that uh, on the boundary of this slice, uh, uh, the uh, metric and the matter fields will um, have fixed values given by the choice of boundary conditions. And the path integral can be um, understood as computing an inner product uh, on a Hilbert space, an inner product between the two states which are um, given respectively by the path integral computed with the boundary conditions on the two sides, uh, so I have wave functions whose arguments are just uh, the metric and the uh, matter fields on this light which satisfy the boundary conditions on partial sigma. Um, I will again use a compact notation in which partial sigma also includes the boundary conditions for metric and matter fields. And this condition on... Uh, on partial sigma are independent of the state, so they actually label the Hilbert space that I have on this slice. So, uh, with the slice, we have a, a, a Hilbert space associated to the choice for the uh, co-dimension two surface partial sigma and uh, the boundary conditions on it. The full quantum gravity Hilbert space uh, uh, will be given by a direct sum over all possible uh, configurations for this um, co-dimension two surface. And note that the no boundary case uh, is the baby universe Hilbert space describing uh, closed universes. And now we can consider a partition of the boundary in two regions and ask is there a notion of subsystem associated to one of these, uh, both of these regions? And can we compute an entropy associated to that? And this is uh, uh, non-trivial because the Hilbert space a priori does not factorize over components associated to R and R bar. Uh, so why this is interesting? Well, uh, a prominent example is uh, uh, the information paradox uh, when we have an evaporating black hole and we want to compute the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation, which is escaping to infinity. So what happens if the gravitational theory has a holographic uh, dual theory living on the boundary, um, as in anti-de-sitter conformal field theory correspondence? So in this case, the Hilbert space uh, uh, decomposes into a direct sum of factors uh, over the two um, regions. Uh, and so there is a sense in which we can talk about the subsystem associated to R and R bar. 
And uh, the Ryuta Kayanagi formula gives an entropy for this region uh, related to the area of some extremal surface in the bulk. And the interpretation of this entropy is clear from the boundary theory point of view. So it's computing the entropy of a special region in the conformal field theory. Uh, the, the Ryuta Kayanagi formula has been derived uh, uh, from the bulk perspective, so from the bulk gravitational path integral um, by Lakovic and Maldacena. Um, an important ingredient is the replica trick. Uh, so we can obtain the von Neumann entropy as a limit uh, of a sequence of Rennie entropies. And crucially, um, given this form of the Hilbert space, there is a precise sense in which we can associate a state for the region R to the gravitational path integral. So we can consider several copies of our system, compute a trace to the gravitational path integral, and in the classical limit, assuming that the bulk saddle preserves the replica symmetry, we get the Ryuta Kayanagi formula. So all this is uh, in the case of holography. So what happens if um, we don't know uh, that uh, an holographic dual theory exists? So can we still talk about the subsystem R? And is the Ryuta Kayanagi formula computing an entropy for this uh, region? And uh, I, I am going to present um, how we uh, address this question. Um, and let me give you uh, an overview of the results first. Uh, so, so as I said, uh, our goal is to understand Yuta Kayanagi without invoking holography. Um, we looked at a specific case in which partial sigma is given by the union of uh, specially compact boundaries. So we have these two disjoint components. And what we did is to construct an algebra of observables uh, through the gravitational path integral associated to these two boundaries. And we show that uh, when the path integral satisfies a given set of axioms, these uh, algebras of boundary observables only include type one factors. This means that the Hilbert space decomposes into a direct sum over uh, factor uh, associated to R and R bar. We have a trace operation on this algebra, which is the one defined by the gravitational path integral. And so we can go through all steps of the lakovic maldacena computation. And now there is a precise sense in which we can associate a state for the R to the R region from the gravitational perspective and compute an entropy for it that will be given by the Ryuta Kayanagi formula. Okay, so uh, what are the actions of the path integral? So we assume that the path integral is finite. Uh, so it is a, a finite answer for smooth boundary conditions. Um, that uh, if we consider the complex conjugate uh, uh, for the path integral on a given space-time boundary, this will be equal to evaluating the path integral for the same manifold where we um, conjugate uh, um, the sources. Then reflection positivity for the positivity of the inner product. Um, we further assume that the path integral is continuous under small deformation of the boundary conditions. Factorization, so if we have two disjoint space-time uh, boundaries, uh, the path integral factorizes over them. And finally, this trace inequality. So uh, consider a space-time boundary M that in this picture is given by the blue circle and imagine to cut it in two parts and then glue back together the two uh, ends points and to form two other um, space-time boundaries, M1, M2. Then the path integral satisfies this trace inequality. Now, it has been shown very recently by Shi Dong and Donald Maroff that this axiom is actually not independent from the other ones. In fact, it follows directly by requiring positivity of the inner product on the full quantum gravity Hilbert space. 
Okay, so um, to construct this algebra of observables from the part integral, um, we, uh, we first construct an algebra for uh, surfaces. So um, as I said, we are looking at the case in which partial sigma is given by the union of two uh, compact boundaries. Um, I will refer to them as right and left. Uh, and we, f uh, to, to, um, to simplify the, the setting, we further uh, take both the right and the left boundary isomorphic to some uh, boundary that we call B. And then we consider the set of surfaces uh, with two B boundaries, and we also require them to have a rim um, in the correspondence of the two extremities, and this uh, is in order to have smooth surfaces when we glue these objects one to the other. We define a multiplication operator on this set, um, uh, in particular a right and left uh, multiplication, which is given by the gluing. These surfaces are oriented, so uh, if we glue the right or the left, uh, um, of course, uh, matters, and so we get from this set of surfaces uh, with, two, with these two uh, multiplication operations, we get um, a right and a left algebra of observable. Um, we can define a conjugation map on this set, which is just given by uh, um, reversing the orientation, conjugating sources, and exchanging the right and left boundaries, um, and a trace which is uh, uh, given by the gluing and evaluation of the path integral in the natural sense. Now, we consider a representation uh, of this algebra on the uh, Hilbert space, so the left algebra acting on the uh, left boundary and the uh, right algebra acting on the right boundary. Then we take the quotient by null states, the closure under the weak operator topology, and we define, we get von Neumann algebras. Um, the, the trace on the surface algebra can naturally be extended uh, to a trace on this von Neumann algebra, and we show this uh, trace to be faithful, normal, and semi-finite. Now, crucially, for type 3 factors, such a trace does not exist, and for type 1 and type 2 factors, uh, uh, a faithful, uh, normal, and semi-finite trace is unique up to uh, an overall coefficient. So um, our von Neumann algebras have uh, general non-trivial center, but we can uh, write them as uh, direct sum or integral over factors. And then when he, by applying the trace inequality to some um, projection over one of these factors, we get that the trace of the projection is bounded below by one. And this tells us that our factors are indeed type one factors. This is because for type two, uh, the trace of projections can, can, can be arbitrarily small. So this means that the Hilbert space on which uh, our algebra acts um, as a decomposition into uh, factors over the, light, the right and the left boundaries and so there is a, uh, a precise sense in which we can construct through the gravitational path integral a state associated to the right boundary, uh, take several uh, replicas, and so um, now these elements are operators in our von Neumann algebra, and we can go through the steps of the lakovics uh, maldacena computation, uh, and so compute an entropy of it that in the semi-classical limit is given by the Ryuta Kayanagi formula. So in this setting, uh, we know how to uh, define a notion of a system to this boundary, compute an entropy, and have an interpretation of Ryuta Kayanagi uh, without assuming holography. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, yeah, time for a brief question throughout this talk. Hi, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I'm really curious about this fact that, the, that there's this factorization possible because typically if you have 
regions of space-time and you try to define uh, the algebra of operators for those. They don't factorize, they're typically you know, type three and so on. So what has gone in, I, that's something I missed, what has gone into your boundary algebra that makes them factorize in this way? Because that seems to be the magic of what you're doing. So I'm just curious, what, how do you get that out? Thanks. So the, the, the crucial ingredient uh, to get this out is the trace inequality. The trace inequality is trivial in a quantum theory, so you can just prove it by, by inserting a, a basis and, and uh, the proof is straightforward. Um, it's non-trivial, of course, from the point when, when elements of the trace inequality are operators uh, constructed to the gravitational path integral. And uh, so, in particular, we require, uh, so uh, as you seen from the actions, the fact that we require factorization of the Hilbert space uh, in a theory which has, for example, baby universe sectors means to restrict to a given baby universe sector. But once uh, the trace inequality holds, uh, and uh, as I said, this is actually, this actually follows by the other actions, um, then uh, these type one factors follow. So this is the key ingredient. Uh, uh, let me also emphasize that uh, um, our work uh, focused uh, uh, on the case in which the two boundaries are disjoint uh, and are spatially compact boundaries. So it's not a case like this, uh, but yeah, we have these two especially compact components. And the next step uh, will be to, to, to focus on the, the other case. Sorry? The, the area, well, in, uh, in, in will be some, some surface in the bulk. So is, is exactly the same uh, procedure and if you apply to, to uh, yeah, you get exactly the, the, the same. So depending on your boundary conditions, uh, you, you, you will get different position for your uh, extremal surface, but it's the area of a surface in your gravitational theory. Okay, thank you. And uh, the program gave us 20 minutes for discussions, which we'll keep. We started a few minutes late, so if all the speakers can come down here and um, can have questions about any one of the three talks. Any question? Thank you for nice talks. I have two questions, one for Catherine, one for Flaminia. Uh, for Catherine, you said at the end, you said that uh, the results that you have or the effects you are expecting to see are not in contradiction with LISA or LIGO or something like that. So it So um, there's a few things to be said. First of all, I don't, I, I trust our calculations, but not at the level of two or four, <laughs> okay? Um, and you have to really be able to compute the power spectral density, which is to say the frequency dependence of the signal. So for example, LIGO has a fabry perot cavity where the light bounces around approximately 40 times before they measure it. And this type of a signal is statistically uncorrelated on time scales which are longer than the single light crossing time, which is to say that the power spectral density is peaked at frequencies which are one on L. They do not have any published measurements at those frequencies, and in fact, they haven't even calibrated their data at those frequencies. And if you compute the power spectral density at the frequencies at which they make measurements, they are not sensitive to this signal because it's suppressed. In principle, depending on what their noise looks at, at frequencies which are the um, light crossing time, 
and depending how strong their constraint is on the strain, you could potentially have sensitivity to this type of signal. So that's something that they're looking into with their data. So by frequency, you mean the frequency of the gravitational wave, right? I, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So when you when they plot their strain sensitivity versus yeah. frequency, yeah. it's that frequency. Yeah. Because so both frequency of them almost have the same same sensitivity in terms of the, the strain. But but frequency-wise, LISA has... Yeah, so if their peak strain sensitivity, if you just translated it over to frequency, which is one in the lake crossing time, they would have very strong sensitivity to this signal. But of course, they don't. <laughs> the, the sensitivity is turning up. Okay. And the question for Flamini is, uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, maybe you talked about the decoherence because that uh, quickly um, basically collapses the, the superpositions so that the clocks to show that one of A, the other one B in, in, in superposition. I don't know how that works. You have the coherence in your theory. So uh, you mean like gravi uh, gravitational decoherence or environmental decoherence? Yeah. No. Uh, so maybe if I, I can add a little bit uh, more on so this experiment with the interferometer, like with the clocks that are sent in an interferometer on the Earth, uh, is actually something that people are trying to realize in uh, Germany. Uh, I think there are a couple of groups. Um, and so what is predicted for this, uh, for this clock, and this is work from 2011 uh, from Mag Mag Magdalena Zich, uh, Fabio Costa, Igor Pikoski, and Czesław Bruckner, um, so is when basically the clock that follows, um, so it's in, is in the higher trajectory, then accumulates some proper time over this trajectory in the interferometer, and the clock that follows the lower trajectory accumulates a different proper time because it, it is in a different gravitational potential. And then if you treat the clocks, well, like, these clocks that I described, like internal degrees of freedom of a quantum system, at the end, you're going to observe a reduction in the visibility of the clock, uh, so, sorry, of, uh, of the visibility of the measurements in the interferometer, so the interference fringes, uh, because of the difference in proper times. And that's something that if you have only the external degrees of freedom, you would not observe. So this is really the, the sign that the clock, uh, so it, it's really a, a clock effect. And so this is basically the effect that one would look for in order to see what the time of the, like that these clocks are, whether the time that the clocks are telling us are different or the same. So this is what, like this is just to complete the measurement. But there is no measurement that is done while the clocks are in the interferometer. So like there is no, uh, yeah, the coherence is not ruined. Uh, this question was for Catherine. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, I've always been confused about the the temperature in the causal diamond. So uh, you were speaking more about uh, other properties, but the te I'm just going to focus on the temperature as one thing that you might try to observe. And the confusion results from thinking about it in two different ways. You can compute the modular Hamiltonian for that region, and you can associate a temperature with the sort of the density matrix of the modular Hamiltonian, and you get one result. But if you think of it um, gravitationally, you think of, uh, say, a, a local UNRU uh, thermometer, so an observer that moves on an accelerated trajectory through that region, you get a totally different answer for, th for the temperature. And I've never quite felt like I understood which one made sense of the calculations in the most clear way. And so that, made, that makes me concerned about associating the modular Hamiltonian calculations with observables. And I was curious if you had a reaction to that. So strictly speaking, the temperature, I, I wrote it down as if it did enter. But strictly speaking, what you get from the uh, calculation is beta times k. It's the thing that enters in the exponent, which is dimensionless, yep. and actually does not independently depend on the temperature. Okay. So, so when you actually compute like delta k squared, 
that's a dimensionless quantity. And so all the statements that I, I wrote down are actually uh, observer independent, which is to say that I can foliate the causal diamond with a series of Rindler observers with different temperatures and beta K is still the quantity that's associated to the diamond, okay? So I, I'm doing this thermodynamic argument because it's an intuitive argument, but I can also look at it from the perspective of a UV observer. And that in fact was the argument that I didn't go through because if you take the ATUF commutation relations, there's an uncertainty between these light ray operators, one that evolves you along the causal diamond and one along the light ray and one that's actually perpendicular to the causal diamond. And so um, one thing that you can do is actually consider the observer that's a Rindler observer that is just Planckian and separated. So this is an ultra UV observer. And then I can go through, I can actually crank through it and ask the question, what is the difference between the proper time of that observer, that Rindler observer, and the one that just followed the light sheets? You get the same answer. And you can actually formalize that in a fluid or a hydrodynamic context by taking the Zotov commutation relations, taking the Einstein equation, giving it a noise source that's exactly the Zotov commutation relations, and that, that width of the stretched horizon is exactly this um, temperature that I just told you about, okay? So one of the reasons why I'm confident that it's not something like that I, I didn't talk about this, but if there's a mountain there and the mountain is real, <laughs> there shouldn't just be one description for arriving at that result. There should be multiple physically equivalent descriptions. And I can, there are these types of calculations that have embedded in them UVIR connections that I don't fully understand yet, but nevertheless, arrive at the same result with a non-trivial scaling in an arbitrary number of dimensions. And that's one of the reasons that I'm confident that this as a theoretical program hangs together. Thank you. Can I ask a question to Eugenia? Um, so you listed some uh, set of axioms, the algebra uh, of observables should satisfy I'm just wondering how um, realistic these axioms are because that's where you got the factorization from. Like, does every gravitational partition function satisfy these kind of axioms? Or uh, well, um, yes, of course. Um, so, uh, one one simple case we we look at is uh, JT gravity, where we can have um, is an example of. Um, JT gravity, where you, you actually have uh, an example for that. Um, uh, so, of course, having a uh, um, gravitational path integral that gives a finite answer, uh, I mean, the, 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 um, this ca can, be, can be seen as, I mean, non-trivial because there are many ways in which uh, it's difficult to make sense of, of the path integral itself. And uh, uh, as I emphasized before, also these, uh, so in a theory in which you have baby universe sectors, this is something that uh, is, uh, the trace inequality and the factorization holds uh, in each of these sectors. Um, so f for the rest, I mean, this is a, like natural axioms that you require to, to have a good definition of a gravitational theory, the, the, the reflection positivity, continuity, uh, finite answer, and, uh, and if you, as I said, if you don't consider Walmart's factorization of the, 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 the path integral. So quite natural axioms, of course, to, to, to um, have concrete examples of theories in which uh, uh, they are all satisfied. This is slightly non-trivial. Yeah, thank you. Hey, 
We have about three minutes. Are there any more questions? I have a question for Virginia that is more like um, personal curiosity. Because the list of axioms and the focus on the boundaries um, seems to me like uh, some topological quantum field theories approach in quantum gravity. So did you explore the possibility of a contact point between this formulation and those other formulation of T with T, uh, also in a way to expand the study to other kind of boundary? Um, mm. No, we didn't yet. So the, this, uh, the strategy was indeed to try to um, include as less uh, assumptions as possible and so st uh, be completely general about uh, the requirements. Um, so the, the only concrete case we, we looked at uh, was as JT with some uh, then so some uh, exploration for Einstein-Hilbert gravity. Um, but um, we no, we didn't look at the or yeah. Final question. Um, yeah, question to Flaminia, maybe a bit naive, but um, I don't know if I understand it correctly. So. If you are in a reference frame which is somehow collapsed or just sharply peaked uh, and you have another system or another duck as you depicted um, which has like some superposition state and now you switch in this reference frame uh, then your first sharply peaked um, object or whatever will have a superposition right but this is more like a coordinate artifact right I, ca I mean is it can it be something physical or uh, yeah, okay, yes, uh, I didn't talk about that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it, it at the moment we have it at the level of description. Then, of course, then in order to have a full characterization of what the state would actually be if we were really to take that quantum reference frame, we also need to make a measurement. And in order to make a measurement, then you immediately run into the measurement problem of quantum theory. So. Uh, that is a, a highly non-trivial um, uh, thing to address. So at the moment, the, the, the most conservative way one can see that is, imagine I have a, a reference frame, usually the, la the laboratory frame, where I can make measurements, but maybe I do, do not have a well-defined question because well, for instance, in this spin case that I mentioned before, the, the spin operator from the perspective of the lab frame was not really easily defined. Then you go to a quantum reference frame where instead the operational interpretation of the observables is clear, you and then you go back to the laboratory frame uh, and map the re operationally relevant observable between the two frames. And then in the end you do the measurement always in the same frame. But, but measurements have to be done and have to be included in the, in the formulation to, to have a complete description. Thank you. Okay, I think these are all the questions and we are at the end of the session. Thanks again to all the speakers. Thank you.